Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I know we have some that are traveling and that type of thing today. Um, announcements. I know a couple of people have asked me um, if you did get the Colleen Post. Blanche uh, is in the hospital. She was admitted Thursday. She is in um, at CMC in Pineville or Atrium or whatever they're calling it these days. But the hospital in Pineville. Um, I called Wanda last night. They found out she has pneumonia and has some fluid on her lungs. She um, has also had a kidney infect infection, which is probably why her kidney function wasn't what it should have been initially when, they, uh, when she was admitted. Um, so, but she is feeling better. She was getting a little snarky. Uh, the physical therapist came in and wanted to say, the guy said, well, you want to get up and walk? And she was like, no. <laughs> so Wanda said she was feeling a little bit better. She was getting back more, a little bit more to herself, so that's good. But please keep her in your prayers. Um, and Wanda said they were hoping maybe for her to be discharged on that. So I guess we'll we'll see if that. She said, you know, it, that's not in stone, and I know for sure it's not in stone. So anyway, but please keep her in your prayers. We have the second reading for the transfer for Thomas White. Uh, from our church to the Capitol Hill Adventist Church in Washington, D.C. He has been up in Washington forever a day. Um, I guess he's finally getting ready to transfer his membership. Um, he was very active when he was here, um, but always used to slip in right after the beginning of the service. But, but that was him. He was a very nice young man. I guess he's older now. We all are. <laughs> um, but uh, I need a motion to accept the transfer. Uh, second. All those in agreement? Uh, okay, I guess it's past that he is this transfer is approved. We have fellowship lunch today, so please um, join us. And after our lunch, we're having a baby shower for Maggie. She's having a baby boy, Eric. Um, it says in July as well. But when is this beginning part of July? At least you don't have to go through the whole summer pregnant. Mm -hmm. My sister had two babies, and one was born in the end of September, and the other was beginning of October, and she said it was miserable being pregnant in the heat. And, you know, so, you know, you get out of all out of part of the summer. Anyway, um, Bible's uh, prayer meeting resumes on Tuesday, June 7th. Uh, we are having a fellowship lunch on June 18th to, uh, in honor of our fathers. Uh, we're bringing just easy, cool summer foods is going to be the thing. So um, that's what we're doing there for that. Uh, I don't think there's any other announcements. Nothing. Is your Bible study on? No, it's not this week. It's going to be. We're taking June off. Oh, you're taking June off. Okay, I did not realize that. Okay, the Thursday morning is taking the month of June off. Oh, praise service. Praising God. I actually had a couple plans and didn't really make a decision until this morning on what I was going to do. But I have a song this morning uh, for everyone. It's called Through It All.
It's now time for our offering, and please offer me this for our church budget. Protection against Babylon's manipulation. Revelation 18.3 says, For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. We worship God with our resources because it is one of God's protective walls against the deceitful one. The Bible portrays Babylon as a major threat to God's people. Prophetic Babylon serving intoxicated wine conveys the idea of deception as noted in Proverbs 21. One of Babylon's final deceptions is to present itself as the source of economic prosperity. This manipulation works well because it appeals to our natural attraction for material gain. Are we not the generation known as lovers of money, as noted in 2 Timothy 3.2? How do we stand in resistance to the deception of Observing squirrels can teach us a lesson. These cute and furry creatures often roam in our backyard, but they are always cautious not to come too close and are furtive when you approach them. However, when their reserve of acorn is almost depleted, this is the time to attract them to you by offering them some nuts. Their need for food leads them to lower their defense mechanism. Effective manipulations function in the same way. They appeal to a perceived need. When one experiences a financial crisis, the means to acquire some income may become particularly attractive. The practice of tithe, systematic offerings, and donations helps us constantly remember that God is the source of true riches, as noted in Deuteronomy 8.18. Hence, we don't have to yield to the Babylonian's manipulative schemes in order to obtain what we need. Furthermore, the craving for material possessions loses its grip over us when we are already appreciative through giving of what we have received. Ellen G. White wrote, Constant self-denying benevolence is God's remedy for the cankering sins of selfishness and covetousness in Testimonies to the Church, Church, Volume 3, page 548. We are called to get out of Babylon. This includes resisting the manipulation of Babylon in issues of finances. Is it safe to neglect to give up this protective gear that our God has given us? This week, through our tithe and regular offerings, we can stand in resistance to Babylon. Lord, we face all sorts of temptations to compromise in matters of faith. We thank you for your instructions given for our safety. It is all of us in response to all of them. Give deeper peace and comfort.
Please join us closely, especially in these closing hours of history. Help us to remain faithful and trust in you. Help us to put all of our love and trust in you and please use these monies to bring a close to this earth's history. Spread your word throughout every nation, tongue, and people. In Jesus' name. Now time for our garden prayer which is listed in the program. If you're able, please kneel.
The noun ceased is followed by the year of the birth, followed by a dash, and then the day of their deaths. This, their lives are represented by this little dash. That says nothing about who they were, what kind of person they were. I mean, this is completely understandable, considering that it's not practical to put a biography, even a brief one, of these people. But it's ironic. I say that. We all remember 9-11 and all the tragedies that happened then. On that day, I was reading the story of a particular fireman who was killed in the process of trying to rescue people, rescue some people from these buildings. <coughs> uh, but then later on that day, I think I read a story about a man who had been electrocuted uh, while trying to steal copper from an air conditioning unit on top of a building. The ironic part is that both lives were represented by a dash. One of these men was a hero trying to save lives. The other, a thief. Um, No matter what great things we achieve or what depths we fall, we'll still all have that symbolic dash. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for men to die once, but then the judgment. Have you ever stopped and think, how will I be remembered? What will my wife and children and grandson remember about me after I'm no longer there? What will my church family, my friends, going to remember? What people, when people hear your name, what will come to their mind about you? What effect will have my death? What effect will my death have on others? Pastor Gill, who was pastor here for five, five better years, but we became very good friends. I love the man. I really did. He was quite an inspiration. But he told me once that if you put your hand in a bucket of water and pull it out, the hope that you leave is what you, how you're going to be missed. That sounds cold and it sounds callous, but it's the truth. Um, it's realistic because life will go on. People will go to work, children will play, and continue to make mistakes to hopefully they learn from. This reminds me of a story of a man who was lying on his deathbed, talking to his youngest son when he smelled this wonderful aroma. He asked his son, son, what's that smell? It smells like your mother's apple strudel that I've always loved. Would you run downstairs and get me some before I leave? The son obediently leaves his leaves and is gone several minutes. And when he finally returns, he returns empty-handed. And he tells his dad that mom says the strudels for after the funeral. And it is. But the point is, the life goes on. They've already made plans for and after the funeral, but life goes on. The truth is that one way or another, we're leaving behind a legacy, especially to those of us who have children, 
grandchildren. I heard a quote that I'll still remember. When you were born, everyone else was smiling and you were crying. Live so, live so. When you die, everyone is crying and you are smiling because you died in Christ. There's three aspects you're going to be remembered. Your spiritual life, your family life, and your social life. The spiritual life is the most important, the absolute, even though all these are intertwined. In your private time, whenever you get a chance, whenever, please read the book of Hebrews. <coughs> uh, it gives special attention to those left a, who left a testimony and a commitment. To give an example, let me read uh, Hebrews 11, 5. Uh, it says, Enoch was taken away that he should not see the first death and was found because God had translated him. But before his translation, he had a testimony that pleased God. What does that say about the way Enoch lived? And how, how close are we, or how far away, are we from living like that, to pleasing God? <clears throat> and I'm sure that we all, everybody, wants to do the same, to please God. Now, Thessalonians 4, verse 1, Finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God. We see this was Paul's driving motive. While speaking, about your spiritual life, consider your relationship with Christ. Material things no longer matter. Only your relationship with a loving Savior. I'm sure there are many people that read obituaries. When you read an obituary, you can start telling a whole lot about people. Uh, where they worked, where they retired from, were they veterans, the various community organizations may be part of that information. The sad part about reading these is there's no mention of a church, which makes you question their relationship with Christ. Now, I will grant you, not belonging to a church does not assure your salvation. But um, but it can build a foundation on which to build this relationship and strengthen our faith through like-minded people. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. How do I want to be remembered? First and foremost, that I love the Lord. I'm always trying to improve my relationship with Jesus. I am a sinner. And I ask for help and guidance and strength. I describe myself, and probably always will, as a work in progress. Because in my mind, I will never be good enough. <clears throat> God knows I'm trying, trying to improve myself with his help. Now, Ruth and I didn't really get involved in church or religious things or reading the Bible till several years in into our marriage. <clears throat> um, we could take or leave church. 
And then we had a tragedy. One of my nephews and his wife, wife of five weeks was killed as they made their way home. And it was a very tragic time. But it showed us something. How fragile is life? How quick can it be taken away from you? I want to be remembered as a good husband, a father, a grandfather, who worked hard to provide for my family. I even had to take a third shift job so we could take care of an infant grandson that we wound up with by surprise. But we did it, but we did it because we cared. Because we had to. I also I want to be known as a Marine that was very honored and proud to have served this country. I was willing to fight and die for what I knew was right, and I still am. How would my death affect my friends? I do have very dear friends, 40, 50 year friends, that have proved themselves many times over. <clears throat> I want to be remembered as part of the team that worked during the good and bad times. They knew about my faith, asked me questions. They remembered that I started a Bible study on the road that lasted several months until they split up our team and were sending us to different states. And it just wasn't feasible to continue those. But it was, it was what honored me more than anything I would be in a hotel room. Somebody would knock on my door. They wanted me to pray with them or for them. Some people, they don't feel comfortable sitting down or kneeling down, praying with somebody. Would you pray for me? Can you pray for my mother? Can you pray for me? But it, I cannot tell you what it did for me. But how do I instill that in somebody else? Uh, and what you love to that a group of people after your death, what you love for one, ten, twenty, a hundred people say that this is the man that led me to Jesus. This is the person that led me to Jesus. <coughs> To my family, I pray that I had fond, that left fond memories. Material things don't last, and they lose significance. My, my mom died a few years ago. She left boxes and boxes of pictures, pieces of memorabilia from years ago when my dad was still alive that was meaningless to me. I'm stuck with pictures of people that I don't know, knickknacks that mean nothing to me. My options are to keep these things until I die and let Ruth and my children throw them away or get rid of them now. And I'm sure that several others have been in that situation. It, eventually, the things that are important to me are not important to anybody else. My point is, things wear out, just become obsolete and insignificant. I heard a quote that I wanted to share with you, and it's from a guy, many, most of you I'm sure have heard of him, by the name of Bruce Lee. And the quote was, instead of buying your children all the things you've never had, you should teach them all the things you've never were taught. Material wears out, knowledge stays. And to me, that was meaningful. What kind of knowledge? We're teaching them, uh, we're teaching you to teach them some of the things that you 
learned as an adult or later on in life. How to make money, financial matters, uh, cooking, how to be independent. But more than anything else, but the most of all to enrich your children with the Word of God. Now you can do that, especially when they're young. Once they have heard this, now the one thing that may a lot of you know this. A lot of young people reject this. But the seed has been planted. And so much time in their life, where they're at their lowest point, they'll know they have a loving Savior. They can come back. Um, our closing hymn is Are you done? Yeah, I was done. That number in the bulletin is incorrect. The song is 499. When a friend of heaven teases. 499. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. I'm hoping that I can, that you allowed me to deliver a message of how important even the things that we pass on after our death are picked up by our children, our grandchildren, our friends, and our relatives. Letting them know that that is the most important if you could pass on one thing, let that be it. Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for your forgiveness and your own.
amazing grace. Be with us this day and this upcoming week and all that we do. Protect us and give us strength and, in, and wisdom to deal with the world around us. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.